Dr. Dave. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a privilege and honor to be here. I'm very excited about uh, talking with you, and I'm very impressed as well. I want to talk about the story of this really incredible organization. I want to, in the spirit of celebration, stimulate you to think more of what you're about. And I think some of this will flow with Wynn's comments about, um, about the strategies and purpose that she mentioned. We learn through stories. Stories are how we understand, how we remember, how we make sense of things. Defense attorneys know this. Little kids standing next to broken vases know this. <laughs> One of my early storytelling mentors passed through the Chicago airport and was stopped by someone who had been to a presentation that he had made four years earlier. And she said, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate and how much an impact your presentation made on me. And he said, would you remind me what I talked about? He said, oh, I don't remember what you talked about, but I'll always remember that story you told. Now, I've co-authored stories with people for four decades as a parent, as a psychoanalyst, in the last decade as an executive mentor coach. And in listening to many thousands of stories and collaborating to enhance them, I've learned a number of things about human dynamics and about how the mind and brain, brain works that I want to apply to philanthropy. The brain needs a story. We are, we have a biology for reciprocation. We have an innate desire to bond and to connect with others. The brain even has a neurotransmitter for philanthropy. That's the first time I believe that term has ever been coined ever, and I wanted to use it, and I'm going to return to that. There's always a dialectic between emotion and rationality, between our right brain and our left brain. The right brain is the elephant. The left brain Rationality is the driver on top, the rider, who holds the reins and looks like he's in control. But if there's ever a disagreement, guess who gets to pick? 12,000 pounds versus 185 pounds. Slam dunk. I would like to, I would like to illuminate, and this is your first quiz. I'm going to sprinkle in a few quizzes. I'd like to illuminate a story that each of you writes has been writing all your life. It has its own history, its own language. It's highly visible to others, but it's often not as visible to you. In fact, one internationally known guru who I was talking with about this said, you know, Dave, I don't know how to tell this story to myself in order to know what to change. It's a story that you talk about every day, think about several times a day, it's intricately simple, yet remarkably complex. It's a story that has its own language, its own encrypted messages, and it's complex because it's emotional, because some of it's unspoken, some of it's unconscious. It's the longest relationship you'll ever have in your life. Your parents talked about it before you arrived. People will talk about it after you're gone. You may get 10 years from a car, you may get 50 years with a spouse, but this story you can't break up with, you can't coax it into loving you more, you can't run away from it. And this story, I think, is also important because it's what you're teaching your children while you're talking about other things. It's an unspoken legacy. It ghostwrites every aspect of your life from what you eat and drink to what you plan and play. Now here's the lifeline clue. The villain or the hero, depending on how you write it, of this story is the most popular legal substance to all peoples of the world. You speak with it, it speaks to you. It's your money, your money story. Now, let's look at how we construct a story. Every day is a blank page. Whatever you think and feel and experience is what you create. Clara Booth Luce, a number of years ago, in 1962, she was one of the first women in Congress, consulted with President Kennedy, 
And what she saw concerned her because she saw immense capacity, but someone who was spreading himself a bit thin was doing, trying to do too much. So her conclusion to him was, every great person is a single sentence. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and preserved the Union. Franklin Roosevelt lifted us from a Great Depression and won a world war. As you reflect on your purpose and the purpose of this foundation, what's your sentence? Now, as we construct a story, we construct a simple story. Complexity is sometimes when you construct two stories simultaneously that go in opposite directions. The surface story may be, I want to create wealth, but the shadow story is, well, money is really unspiritual, or I think it's just people who are really lucky who make money. An attorney client, uh, just recently, someone I, I am coaching, gave another illustration of this. She was approached by her dad, who said, I'd like you to be the executor of my estate. And my client said, well, sure, I'll be happy to, Dad. First, I need to know some things about your assets, the extent of your property, and your wishes. And he looked at her and said, well, that's none of your business. <laughs> now, neuroscience has been teaching us a great deal that I think has some special relevance for this group and for how we think about philanthropy. Neuroscience has some, inf has some information about motivation and performance and, and the, the balance of those two. There are two centers in the brain that relate to this. The pleasure center that, that's mediated by dopamine that among other things is stimulated by making money and spending money. And the other is the altruism center that's stimulated by helping others and forming bonds. And the mediating chemical here is oxytocin. This is the philanthropic neurotransmitter. It's highest at the time of greatest bonding, at time of birth that induces labor. Now, these two centers compete with each other. When one turns on, it turns off the other one. Let me give you an example about that, about how uh, a personal pleasure or a personal motivation can hijack uh, a different kind of agenda. A large blood donation center was running low on supplies. And they decided to incentivize donation by offering money. Immediately, donation dropped half. The only way they could move donation back up to where it was is arrange for a way for people to donate the money to a charitable cause. One more brief example. Some daycare centers in Israel were noticing that parents were picking up their children a bit late, and this was creating some stress on the staff, so they wanted to prompt people to get there on time, so they began to charge for the amount of minutes that someone was late. This immediately tripled the amount and the extent of the lateness because people were not concerned anymore about helping out the staff. They had commoditized time and began paying for it. Now, I want to look with you. I want to look with you at some principles of creating stories. There are four principles I want to talk about. One is our experiences are always consistent with our theories. Our beliefs are the software that write our behavior. We tell our story and then our story tells us. Uh, let me give you an example of this. A number of years ago, this is out of Oxford, there were two anthropologists who were chosen to live in as similar in ape colonies as could be found. They were chosen because of their remarkable similarity of personality, training, philosophy, education. They enter the ape colonies, stay in, stayed immersed for a year, and not communicating, and then emerged to compare results. They expected remarkable similarities, but instead found r amazing discrepancies. The initial one anthropologist had a harmony, had a sense of unity, got remarkable data, achieved a real comfort. The other anthropologist was always on the social periphery, always on the cusp of something bad happening, always anxious about what might happen. They couldn't figure out 
the discrepancies, the differences here, and they puzzled, they and their teams puzzled for months until they finally found one difference. The anthropologist who had the continuing difficulties and, and the discomfort had a gun. Now, he never used the gun. The apes never knew he had a gun. They never saw it, but he knew he had a gun. He knew if things got tough, he had an out. The other anthropologist knew he'd either make it or break it on his own. And in retrospect and reconstruction, each of their assumptions created the stories that they experienced. Uh, another brief example, uh, someone I know was talking about, uh, who, who went to a, a Catholic all-girls school, and at her prom, she said she started a rumor that the punch was spiked and everybody got drunk. <laughs> Secondly, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And some things you simply have to believe in order to see. And a story can define possibility. Now, in each, of, each of you know this story. In centuries of recorded time, no one had broken the four-minute mile. In 1954, Dr. Roger Bannister did. Within the next 12 months, over a dozen other runners broke the four-minute mile. The obstacle of the impossible could no longer be constructed. A story can define possibility. Third principle, a new story occurs by conscious choices at the present moment. Ben Fletcher at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK did a study in which he offered volunteers two options among choices of behaviors, such as introvert, extrovert, um, reactive, proactive, talk about sports, talk about uh, business, and he asked these people to do their pick each day and then in addition, twice a week, they picked a food that they would have never eaten before. And twice a week, they decided to read something they had never read before. Now, guess what the biggest difference after four months in this study for these participants? They lost an average of 11 and a half pounds. Now, this had nothing to do with the diet. But here's the rationale. When they recognized that everything they did was a choice, everything they ate was a choice, even Every bite they ate was a choice, so they then recognized that they could not only choose, but they could say, is this in my best interest? And in follow-up, over the next six months, most continued to lose weight, and no one reverted back. 